Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage Conversations with Healthcare Leaders. I am super excited today to have with me Jeff Solheim. Jeff is a nurse. He has a very long and illustrious career in, in doing so much with emergency nursing and also missions around the world, helping out underprivileged, uh, underprivileged societies and cultures and civilizations and so much stuff. I cannot wait to jump into uh, helping you learn about all the fantastic stuff he's doing. Jeff, thank you so much for being with me today. You know what? You're very welcome. And I'm going to turn the gratitude back to you. Thanks for, for having me and for just being, uh, for allowing me to be able to share my story. I, I, absolutely. I absolutely. And I want to get into the, I want to get into your story, but, but first I'd like to start with a little, uh, a little assignment, a little exercise that I do with all of my pre-meds at Notre Dame. It's their first assignment. And I pose them with a question and I'd like to pose that same question to you. And that question is, before we get into Jeff Solheim, the professional, can we talk about Jeff Solheim, the person, and could you share with us a story of a time that someone has been there for you, or a story of a time that you have been there for someone else? This is the basis of presence and compassion uh, that this podcast is all about. Yeah, you know, I, I will. I'm going to go a long ways back. And not that I haven't had plenty of people there for me throughout my life. But I think one of my defining moments that really set me on my path for life occurred when I was a teenager, and I was diagnosed with uh, lymphatic cancer. And um, I tell this story frequently, but I, um, I, I was I was a teenager, you know, 15 years old, and I was in that odd place where I wasn't old enough to be on an adult ward. I mean, sorry, on a pediatric ward. So they put me on an adult ward uh, during my diagnosis. Um, so they, they suspect that I had cancer, but I, you know, back in the day, we didn't have CAT scans and stuff. So, you know, diagnosis took a long time. So I spent um, uh, well over a month in a hospital and they put me on a medical ward um, for oncology. So you imagine that all my roommates in this four bed ward were 80 or above all with cancer and they would code at night and die. I mean, it was just a horrible experience for a 15 year old to face cancer and be put into that place, but that's what happened back in the day. So anyway, as the story goes, um, part of my diagnosis was to have a bone marrow aspiration um, and to, to actually stage the cancer that I had been diagnosed with. Now, another part of the story I have to tell is that I ended up having to go to a city far from where we lived just because of geography. So I was three hours from my home and my parents had to stay back in, 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 in work and take care of the rest of the family while I went through this, this diagnosis kind of alone up in, in, in the city I was in. So I really had to rely heavily on the medical staff for support because my family, you know, was, although they called me every day, they just weren't there physically because of work and family. And so the nurses really became my support. But I'll never forget, um, it was back in the day where we had what was called primary nursing, where I would have the same nurse every day, Monday to Friday, who kind of led my care. And it just so happened she had a day off. I don't know if it was a vacation or a sick day. I have no idea at this point. But there was a PRN nurse that filled in. And I don't even remember her name, but I can tell you exactly what she looked like. Now, to me, she looked older, but remember I'm 15. So somebody who was 30 years old looks old at 15, right? Yes, she looked older to me. She had blonde hair. She had a pulled back in a bun. She had this perfect uniform on. She was very quiet. She came in that morning and she said, so you're going to have your bone marrow aspiration today. I'm like, yep. She says, well, would you like me to sit with you during that bone marrow aspiration? Now I'm 15. I'm far too cool for anyone to sit with me. However, I'm also a very kind person. So I agreed to let her sit with me, not for my sake, but just to make her feel better. So later that morning, the residents came in, they set up everything for this bone marrow aspiration. And the nurse came in and she pulled up a stool and she sat at the bed on the other side uh, where I would be facing. So when the attending physician arrived, he had me roll on my side um, and I faced this nurse who was now sitting in a stool at my bedside. She sat there quietly. She didn't say anything. She didn't try to take my hand. She just sat there as a presence. 
And then they began and, and it was horrible. It was a painful, painful procedure. You know, I'll never forget as they ground that, that drill into my hip bone, you could feel every piece of bone grinding as they went in there. And then when they started to pull that bone marrow out, that stinging pain that's so deep in your, in your, you know, leg and pelvis and the tears started coming out of my eyes and that nurse didn't say much. She just kept sliding her hand a little closer to mine. Um, not grabbing it, but making sure I knew that it was there. And then as the pain got unbearable, I reached out and I grasped her hand and I squeezed it for all I had. And she didn't say anything. She didn't embarrass me. She just let me hold her hand. She was just there for me. Well, as soon as they were finished, the doctor gave me the words I would never want to hear, but he said, we didn't get enough bone marrow from the first side. I'll need your permission to do the other. And honestly, I couldn't even think of doing that. And I'll never forget that nurse. She leaned down so quietly. So nobody, but I could hear her. And she says, we can do this together. And she gave me the strength to say, yes, we can do the other side and flipped over and they moved the equipment. And this time I wasn't even embarrassed to reach out and grab her hand before they started the drilling. And I held it, and I squeezed it for all it was worth. And I'm sure she probably lost a finger to gangrene from how much I, I held her hand. But she, again, she didn't embarrass me. She didn't do anything, but just quietly let me hold her hand, um, you know, where nobody could see it. And it was all finished. The team left the room and she just sat there quietly. For me, it seemed like she might have sat there a half hour. I doubt it was that long, but that's what it seemed at the time. And again, she didn't say anything. She was just a presence. She was just there. And then when it was time, she quietly got up and she left the room. And although she finished caring for me that day, that's the last I would ever see of her. I've told her story, you know, to hundreds of thousands of people as a motivational speaker and yet I've never had a chance to thank her, yet she changed my life. She set the course for my life. She's the one that really influenced me to become a nurse and, and so on. And so this, this nurse that took care of me for one day that simply sat at my bedside and quietly gave me a hand would really change my life and ultimately you know, um, affect the, the, the lives of so many others. So I think when I look at presence, that's the story I'll never forget. That is a beautiful example of presence. One of the, one of the definitions that, that I use for compassion is non-judgmental awareness. And you had that from her. That's, that's a beautiful example of simply being aware. I, I, one, of, one of the guests that we bring in during the semester is a palliative care doc. And she says anytime she's meeting with, with patients, she keeps a box of tissues on the desk, on the table between them, but she will never pull out a tissue and hand it, sorry, and hand it to a patient. She will just have them there because she feels like if she pulls that tissue out and hands it, then that patient feels like they have something to clean up, but keeping it right there, as you were talking about the nurse holding her hand close to you, but then you, the patient being the one who can reach out and grasp, that's, that's the illustration that, that I keep seeing through my mind is having that presence there and letting the other individual reach out. Does that sound like that's an accurate summation of, of the experience you're talking about? Absolutely. And you know what, I have no idea if that nurse thought that deep into it or not, but she just knew how to manage a teenager, um, you know, and yeah. That's, gosh, what a beautiful story. And you say that that, that experience as a 15 year old cancer patient, that is what set your feet in motion to become a nurse and to touch the world with your work. So let's let's go from the 15 year old Jeff into the adult Jeff and starting a career. And uh, let's let's go back to that time if we can. Well, yeah, and you know, my, my cancer would would shape even 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 my career choices. Um, you know, I I had always said from the time I was very young that I wanted to go to uh, to to. To, I'm going to say to be a missionary doctor, and that's because I was raised in a, the home of a pastor. So my dad was a pastor, and I had that influence in my life. And when the missionaries would um, come to our church to raise money, they would stay at our house. So I got to hear their stories. And from a very young age, when everybody else wanted to be a famous basketball player or 
you know, uh, you know, whatever their career choice was, what did, what did I always say? I always wanted to be a missionary doctor. And that's really where I, I focused my attention in my growing up years. But of course, at 15, cancer was going to bring that to a crashing halt. You know, we didn't even know if I would survive, but certainly if I did survive, you know, my, my need to be near medical care would end any really option of me going overseas to work. So I was honestly a little bit lost, Marcus. I, I graduated from high school with no sense of direction because my whole life's plan came crashing down at 15. So I did, uh, there was a nursing school in the town that I lived and it just was easy for me to go to nursing school because I could live at home, you know, and save that money. And so I went to nursing school, but again, I wasn't sure what I was going to do coming out because I couldn't do this, this, you know, go overseas to work. So, um, I went to nursing school and I got a job in a hospital, but I honestly didn't feel completely fulfilled because I'm not sure that's really what my mission in life was. And so um, it was finally my father who in his wisdom said, you know, you don't have to go live overseas, but you can go help. Now this was, this was back in the day. I mean, we're talking here about the early nineties when there wasn't a lot of options for short-term medical work, you know, the organizations didn't, um, weren't around that were there today. So, and maybe my stupidity or is it my bravery? Let's go with bravery. I decided to strike out on my own. And so I got two of my new nursing friends who had never been overseas before. And we put a little bit of medicine into a bag and we struck out. And this was my first time to even leave the United States. And now I'm going to save people in the Dominican Republic. But it was a life-changing moment for me. I mean, I was just so overwhelmed with the need and with what I was able to accomplish on that trip. And let me tell you, I was so ill-prepared on that trip. And I don't think we did much good, but my eyes were opened to this world. And that would really start me on my journey. And like you said, your eyes are open to the amazing amount of need in this world. And those of us who spend all of our time domestically uh, may not see that need as, um, as clearly as those of us who have stepped on foreign soil in developing nations. Uh, so, so you saw the need. When did, when did it go from you and a couple of friends carrying a backpack full of medicine to a Caribbean country to, to I, I know I've heard stories of you uh, taking canoes, wooden canoes, dugout canoes downstream in Latin America and uh, going to villages in remote parts of, of the jungle. So when did it go from this you and a couple of friends to something bigger? You know, it happened pretty organically. I, I would like to sit here and tell you that I had this great dream of developing some organization, but that's not really how it developed. It just became a burning passion within me. And I just started returning, um, you know, for many years just to the Dominican Republic. But each time I would go, more people would want to join me and, and the word spread and, you know, the work grew and we we were able to build a, a school there and, and a hospital and, we were able to, you know, work with local healthcare providers and that's, and I got better at it. You know, each time I went, I learned what we needed to take. And I learned a lot more about capacity building. And um, from there, um, you know, the, the media started to get their hands on the story. And so then word spread further. And not only did we get more volunteers, but suddenly I was getting calls from other countries, hearing about the work we were doing and inviting us. And it just slowly organically grew, you know, over almost a 30 year period um, from, from that simple trip with my two new graduate friends to an organization that would deploy, you know, ultimately almost 500 people a year and treat almost a half a million people around the world. That is amazing. It really was. And, and now that, that, that you, have, you, you did this, right? Do you look back on that and say, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, when, when I think back over the years of the work that I've done, it, it's hard to quantify and qualify um, impact. 
you've got a lot more stats and people whose lives have been touched. Um, how do you how do you look back on that now? I assume you're extremely proud of that work that you've done. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's it's part of my legacy. However, maybe one of my strengths and weaknesses is um, is my inability to really do a good good uh, view of 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 my life. And to me, it's, it's, I don't look at it as some great accomplishment. I mean, it's something I'm proud of and I don't want to minimize that, but it's, it's just the thing I did, you know, I, I, yeah. So I don't look at it much more than, yeah, that was, that was my life. That's how it unfolded. I would like to take great credit, but as I said, it, it just happened organically. And honestly, it, it was the backs of my volunteers that, you know, that gave up their vacations and, and paid their way to go and, support the work. I mean, they deserve just as much credit as I do. So it's, it's not me. It's, it's just a thing that happened. It's a thing that happened, but it certainly takes a vision at the beginning. And, and I am extremely proud of what you've done overseas and, and domestically too. And, and not just with the, the medical missions, but your leadership and, and your skill set brought you a few years ago to the presidency of the um, Emergency Nurses Association, right? Can we talk a little bit about your tenure and your involvement with this organization? Absolutely. You know, I, I am a, a proud nurse. I'm very, very proud to say that I'm a nurse and I'm very proud of um, not only the profession, but um, you know, what, what nurses do every day. And boy, I can't say that any more than right now, as we go through uh, this time that we're going through, I couldn't be more proud to be a nurse. Um, but, um, you know, I was mainly emergency and trauma were my specialties. And so early on in my career, I did get involved in my professional association and really begin to understand the importance of professional involvement. You know, that if you're gonna be part of a profession, you need to make sure that you are an advocate for that profession and for, you know, for, for the patients we care for. So I got involved with the Emergency Nurses Association early on in my career and was quickly, you know, um, uh, ingratiated into that culture and, you know, had a chance to get involved at many levels. I, I can't say that I ever aspired to the presidency. I do remember early in my time there um, going to a conference and seeing the president standing up there with and I was just like oh my goodness can you imagine like representing your profession and I was so in awe of that president but to me that wasn't something I would ever aspire to nor think that I could rise to so you know as opportunities continued to open in the professional association and I became more known um, I was actually approached by the chief executive officer of the organization at the time asking me if I would run for the board. And my first thought was no, you know, and I told him that, you know, that's just not the, the, the season or time of my life. Um, however, um, he was persuasive and ultimately I would run and, and get a seat on the board. And um, again, no desire for the presidency. And I had kind of said that early on. And then by that point, my career had taken off in many other ways. And I knew the sacrifices I'd have to make as a president, but again, I guess I have this sense of responsibility. And so as I served on the board, um, there was definitely a need for a leader that I just happened to have the right skills for, and it just seemed like the right time. And so I was approached again about running for president and I did, um, I was elected and it was an amazing experience. Um, I'm not going to say I, I loved it because it definitely put me out of my comfort zone. I'm a very private, introverted person. So to be thrust into the public eye for a year was a challenge for me. And I can't say I loved that part of it, but to represent my profession and to lead us um, and, 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 and leave the legacy behind that I did, especially putting a strong eye on philanthrop philanthropy um, I have to be really, really proud of my year. Um, I'm glad it's done. I'm proud of what I did, and I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> I say that, and guess what? I'm the president of another nursing organization right now. <laughs> you are. Which one is that? I'm the president of the Nursing Organizational Alliance. So, okay. 
I, I took yeah, I took a step up for me and a but um, so I said I'd never do it again. And here we are. And you know, what's ironic is, again, it really was, you know, the opportunity. They, they needed somebody to really lead during this pandemic, and to be the face of nursing. And um, with my philanthropic work, it just seemed like a natural fit for me to be in this position to to represent, you know, nursing during this difficult time for our profession. And and we're talking about the Emergency Nurses Association, which is one of the largest nursing associations, I believe. Correct? Yeah, it is. It is in the in the top tier when you look at nursing organizations. It's it's one of the larger in the, in the group of the larger ones. Yes. And so you're talking tens of thousands of emergency nurses from all over the world, not just the U.S. And in addition to being an emergency nurse yourself, now you are traveling near constantly to go out and be the face of the Emergency Nurses Association for a year. This is on top of your own personal professional work. Um, that sounds like a very, very busy year with lots of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yes, 400,000 miles traveled during my year as president. Wow. I don't even want to think about that much time on an airplane. Um, <laughs> kudos to you for that. I think I remember, Marcus, there was one week where, see if I can re recreate it. I, I was in Norway, meeting with emergency nurses in Norway. And then I flew the ocean, landed in New England, spoke at a conference in New England, then I flew down to North Carolina and met with nurses in North Carolina, then I flew over to Arizona and spoke at a conference in Arizona, and then I went up to Kelowna, British Columbia and met with Canadian nurses all in a period of six days. That's a lot of time on airports. <laughs> that, was, that was my life for a year, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think the uh, I'm not a member of the association, but I certainly have many, many friends like yourself who are members of the association. And I believe you left the association in a better spot than when you came in. So thank you. And thank you from those of us who uh, who have been patients in the emergency room, who have dealt with so many emergency nurses. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done uh, in that realm, in that aspect. And I know that you have personally done emergency nursing in an area that that others might think is really, really cool and a really great vacation. Can you tell us a little bit about when you have been a nurse on cruise ships? Yeah, yeah I've actually had a chance to to experience nursing in a lot of unique situations. Certainly, you know, I, I worked a lot of years in the hospital and did a lot of years of hospital administration. However, I did have a chance to um, practice nursing in some unique situations. I was a cruise ship nurse and worked um, uh, part-time. So I only did, you know, three weeks a year, but worked uh, with, a, with a cruise line and uh, did cruise ship nursing. I also spent a lot of my years as an international flight nurse. So, you know, I would fly over to, um, I, I covered Asia, Australia, New Zealand. So I would fly to whatever location um, we were needed to pick up a patient. I was on a huge uh, ICU uh, plane, ICU fitted plane, and I would fly these patients back to the United States, repatriate them. So I did that for a lot of years. And then, of course, you know, I practiced nursing in the developing world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I've got a real good opportunity to see nursing from many different angles. And, and it's not just the nursing from angles, but it's the human experience, right? It, 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 it's the ability to roll up your sleeves and put on your, your, you know, your jungle wear and go down and get in the muck with other human beings. It's not a clinical setting with a, with a you know, $20 million plane that's outfitted with all the latest emergency room equipment. This is, this is you being with people um, and those who are suffering. And so, so can that curtail, uh, can we take the, the discussion into the work that you're doing in, in homelessness these days and how that, that philanthropic uh, bend that you've always had, how that's manifesting today? Yeah, so, you know, as I, I neared the ENA presidency, it was readily apparent I wasn't gonna be able to maintain everything I was doing, you know, I was 
at the time running my own company. Um, and um, I was, um, uh, you know, running Project Helping Hands as well as, as my own company. And then I had, you know, all, all the other things that I would do and something, you know, had to go. And so I decided that Project Helping Hands uh, would be, and Project Helping Hands is my third world organization, that I would uh, leave my um, third world organization when I became the ENA president to, to carve out the time necessary for that role. And, and there was many reasons I did it, but one of them is I had been leading Project Helping Hands for 27 years. And I just felt like I had taken it to a, a level I was very proud of. We were, you know, we were at the highest we had ever been when it comes to revenue and volunteers, you know, I, and I thought, let's, let's go out on the top, but let's give the opportunity for someone else to take it to the next level. Because maybe after 27 years, my ideas ran out. So anyway, I did. I left Project Helping Hands, but I knew that my, my heart for philanthropy would not go away. And I committed myself at that point to more domestic work. I had really, you know, focused so much of my early life on the international world, but there's there's many domestic needs. And homelessness is definitely something I've always had a heart for. I've loved working with the homeless in, in the emergency setting, and I've had other opportunities to interact with them. And so when I was the ENA president, we happened to have our conference in Pittsburgh, and there's a physician in Pittsburgh that started a um, street clinic where he works with homeless on the street. And when I learned that, I decided I needed to spend some time with him when I was in Pittsburgh for the presidency. And um, I was just so amazed with his work. And his name is Dr. Withers, by the way. So people may have heard him. He's you know, been on TV and everything. So I got to spend some time with him. And he taught me how to work with the homeless, how to interact with them, even how to dress and when you're going out on the streets. And that really set me on the path to... Um, to wanting to to kind of replicate that work in, in the city I live, which is Portland, Oregon. So I came back and I started going out on the streets and dressing up and it really turned into a project where I started sleeping on the streets and spending the night on there. Um, and uh, an amazing, to me, just an amazing experience to, to get out on the streets and to see how these people struggle to live, to learn their lifestyle, to learn their culture. And, you know, just before the pandemic, I had decided it was time for me to take my next big leap. And I was, I had applied for a grant to open up a homeless shelter, but unfortunately COVID happened and, and everything folded. And at this point, you know, we haven't, we haven't really gone back into the work because COVID's still rampant at, at the time of this taping. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of how I made that transition from the international to the domestic field. So, so bringing it back to domestic here at home, uh, I, as I said, I've got a, bunches and bunches of nurses uh, who are friends who are emergency nurses, trauma nurses, etc. And lately, lately, um, I've been feeling and reading emotions from nurses, specifically emergency room nurses, but also ICU, med surge, etc. And, an emotion and a feeling that I have not witnessed in my 20 years of, of working closely with nurses. And that emotion these days is frustration. And if I could add a second one onto that, it's anger. When, when you think of emergency nurses today, especially here in Florida where I am and other hot spots around the country, what kind of advice after decades of being an emergency nurse and, and working through all of these, these different ways of providing presence and, and healthcare, um, what, what kind of advice, what kind of guidance would you give to nurses these days who are really feeling such frustration bordering on anger, even for the very patients that they're taking care of? Boy, you know, if, if I had the perfect answer to that, I think I would be a rich man. Um, you know, so I, I have to I have to fall back on what I sometimes feel seem like pat answers, but I think they're pat answers because there is no great answer. But the first thing I just I got to stress the most is, is we have to take care of ourselves. And we hear that over and over again. And and nurses sometimes suck at it to be really frank, you know, I mean, our whole mission in life is to take care of others. So the thought of taking care of ourselves becomes very uncomfortable. And as I look at 
the current pandemic and you know, uh, uh, you know again at the time of this taping the delta virus or the delta variant is is just taking over and filling our icus again and we're all back to working double shifts and overtime and and we feel a responsibility to that and, and in a small way we are healthcare professionals we do have a certain responsibility however we do have a responsibility back to ourselves it's okay to say no it's okay not to go in every time they're short and every time three of your coworkers are out with COVID and, and the, you know, the department is short and yes, we feel that responsibility to our coworkers and we do have a certain responsibility. I, I don't want to absolve us of that, but we have to, we have to be able to balance that with our own responsibility to take care of ourselves. So first and foremost, take care of yourself. Um, you know, I, I do also find, you know, you, that you, if finding what it is, that's your Zen, that's your, your place of of beauty of, of relaxation you've got to find that and then you've got to you've got to make sure that fits into your life so even if you are having to contribute additional time right now you know what is that zen for you that it just lets you get away and make sure that that balance is there and then i think part of it is how do I say this? I heard a saying once that I think is so powerful and I, I really adhere to it, but true maturity is realizing that not everybody sees the world the way you do. And I think we really have to believe that at some point, there are a lot of people, and I'm going to speak specifically of our country, but I'm sure it could be extrapolated internationally, but let's just speak of the United States. There are a lot of people in the United States that don't necessarily see the world the way I do as a healthcare worker. And, you know, they're not taking what I think are this, the basic precautions of masking and vaccinating and just those basic things. And um, it angers me because that just means that, you know, the Delta variant was, the Delta variant was allowed to, to excel. It means that the ICUs are full and I'm having to work overtime. It means that I'm watching one of my relatives die right now. Um, and it's, it, I want to be angry and there's a certain part of me that's going to be angry, but I have to realize that I have to be mature and that not everybody sees the world that I, the way I do. That it's a beautiful, that's a beautiful statement. And, and it's when I, when I hear other friends who are not as familiar with nursing as I am, or they're not healthcare professionals, uh, when I hear them expressing these same kinds of emotions that, that our nurses are being worked to the bone, our doctors are being worked to the bone, our RTs are, are yeah. yeah. Um, but they, they don't seem to understand that especially in emergency nursing, this is not uncommon, right? When you're working in an emergency room, you have frequent flyers. You have, uh, whether the, the, the patients are homeless or they're uh, complicated medical histories or mental illness, et cetera, et cetera. You see many of the people repeated in your emergency room. And so this idea of growing frustrated at another person's actions is something that I feel like emergency nurses are better able to cope with because they do it more in general. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It is part of our life. You know, how many yeah. smokers do we take care of who are dying of COPD and, you know, just go down the list, you know, it's just part of what we do. And um, you know, I don't want to, again, I don't want to absolve our responsibility of, of being educators and saying it's wrong. You have to be vaccinated. You have to stop smoking. If you have COPD, we, we can't absolve ourselves of that. But I also don't think that we can accept responsibility for everybody else's action. And if somebody comes in sick with COVID who refuses to be vaccinated, or somebody comes in with a COPD exacerbation who smokes, I can't be responsible for that. And I, you know, again, I, I just have to learn that I have a responsibility. I, I carry it out. And then I have to let the person um, act or choose not to act on it. And I can't own what they do. And again, I'll say it, true maturity is when you realize that not everybody sees the world the way you do. It's a beautiful statement, and and it brings up another question. Then, so so for those who have a little more trouble letting that go, um, you you said they need to find their place of Zen. 
what, what is your place of Zen? What, what do you do when you need to get out of the, the future or the past and be present in the moment? What, what's your practice? Oh, Marcus, are you going to make me admit this publicly? <laughs> Maybe, I guess. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that I find enjoyment in, but what I have really, really found to be my sin place during the pandemic, I can't believe I'm saying this, I was playing video games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. It, yeah, it's just really become, you know, when I, I, I can just kind of escape into the reality of the video game I'm playing and boy, I don't know, maybe some um, psychotherapist is going to uh, want to give me a call and say that that's not the most uh, healthy coping mechanism. But you know what, it's worked for me. So I'm going to go with it. I'll tell you what, uh, Fortnite or whatever you're playing is is probably a lot better than hitting the bottle or <laughs> um, or hitting too many carbs. We know we know all too well the coping mechanisms. And it seems like video games might be one of the healthier. You know what? I, I happened to hear a news story this morning that I'm doubting its validity, but there was a study that came out that said playing video games uh, burns 472 calories an hour. I'm like, yes, please tell me that's true. I can't imagine it is, but I'm going to believe it for now anyway. <laughs> great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so before we wrap up today, is there anything that you like if you had I, I know that one of your one of your loves and passions is is world travel. And it's not always just doing medical missions and and such just solo world travel that is that is i feel like you, we've got the compassion from from uh your philanthropic heart and and your work all these years but the courage there there's a courage aspect here when when people hear about solo world travelers that will just fly into a foreign country where they don't speak the language, they've never been there before, they don't know the currency, they don't know the culture, they don't know anything, and you have chosen to embrace that. And so, so I, I guess one of the questions I had is what would, you, what would you suggest for those who are thinking about taking that type of leap into world travel, foreign travel, and, and um, yeah, what, what would you suggest? What, what have been the, the biggest lessons that you have learned from that? And how can other people take part in those types of self-education uh, experiences? Let me start by going back to something I used to say frequently to people who considered being volunteers at Project Helping Hands, and that is to really know yourself. You know, going on, for example, a Project Helping Hands trip wasn't for everybody. And if people who, you know, it wasn't in their being to do that would have been a miserable trip. And I wouldn't have encouraged them to do it. And I would say the same thing about international travel. You have to know yourself. Is that your passion? You know, and then what is your passion? You know, some people, their passion is to go to a place and sit on the beach. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. For me, my passion is to go to the most crazy, exotic, off the wall place in the world that I can find, and then live that culture. And that's my passion. And you know what, there's a lot of people like me in the world that have that passion. So number one, know where your heart is when it comes to travel. And then number two, and this is something else I frequently say as a motivational speaker, but the biggest thing that often stands between us and what we really want is usually us. And if you've always wanted to do international travel and, you know, you look at my life and say, oh, my goodness, Jeff, I can't believe, you know, you traveled to that crazy place that I did. I'd say, well, why haven't you? I mean, I, I'm no different than than anybody. You know, it, you know, I'm just a little kid born in North Dakota to a pastor and live my life. I don't have anything special, but I just know my passion and I'm not afraid to strike out. And I think that doesn't just go with travel. That's just a good motto in life. Don't die regretting you didn't do something because it's probably your fault you didn't do it. Um, you know, live your life and, and you know, take risks if that's, if that's what your life is. Again, not, that's not for everybody, for, but for me it is. I just got back, you know, from a pretty crazy adventure into Armenia and the country of Georgia. And yes, I was a solo traveler and I, I went hiking through the mountains of 
Georgia and I don't speak the language and I didn't have a tent. So I knocked on doors and I slept in people's homes at night. Um, you know, and they fed me and I went on my way the next day hiking and people might think that's crazy and other people might say, oh, that sounds like a great thing. And what I'd say to them is then why haven't you done it? Because I, 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 I'm not special. I just, I just did it. And that's, that's how you get to experience life is by removing the barriers and doing the things you want to do. Doing it, just doing it. And so, so where is the, uh, you just mentioned hiking through the mountains. Where is the place of highest elevation that you have ever stepped foot? Oh boy. Um, yeah, Bolivia. And that would be during medical mission work, not, um, not as a traveler, but I worked in the Andes Mountains, and I think we worked at about sixteen thousand feet when we were with some of the um, some of the Ketchin tribes up there. Um, yeah, I think I think six to, somewhere around sixteen thousand feet, if I'm not mistaken, would have been the altitude I worked at, and it was awful. It was enough to make me say I'll never be a mountain climber. I mean, the headaches, the vomiting. I mean, I just remember, you know, we obviously had an oxygen saturation machine because we were medical. So I could measure my oxygen saturation just sitting there waiting for the next patient to come. And I sat it in the high 60s. I mean, we should be satting at about 95 or above. And, you know, I'm satting at 65, 67% just sitting there. So, yeah, I lost some brain cells, but it was great. You live to tell the story. So let's say, let's say that metaphorically, uh, you are standing on that highest point in the Andes and you have the ear of the entire world. To close today, what, what would be the message that if you have the ear of the entire world, what's the message that you'd like to send? Um... You know, I, I've kind of said it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat it. But I, I I'm gonna say that you know, know your know who you are, and then live your life to the fullest. We we only have one life, and you know, I I just I just it it hurts me when I hear people talk about regrets of things they didn't do, and I, I just I just so badly want to say then do it. And so if I, if I had to get to the top of the world, it might be, it might surprise people what I'd say, but it would be something along that line, you know, know what your passion is in life, pursue it with all you have and never, never die in regret. That is fantastic guidance and such a great word. Jeff Solheim, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Uh, I look forward when we can have some time socially again. And, and I cannot thank you for all of your, cannot thank you enough for all of your insights and wisdom that you shared with us today. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations with Healthcare Leaders. Uh, we will link to the things that Jeff talked about in the show notes. And again, Jeff, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you for having me, Marcus.